okay so Good afternoon everyone. Today we will uh, talk about ASIC design flow and EDA tools and how we can actually use these EDA tools in hardware security perspective. So, first of all I would like to remind you that uh, you all need to know uh, uh, what is your group number, uh, I mean your project group number. So, this you can actually check uh, in canvas by uh, logging into your uh, people's tab and uh, uh, there you will find the project group. So, uh, you please make sure that you all are uh, grouped into your uh, project groups and you uh, already know your group number and which project you are actually entitled to. And I would like to remember that uh, homework 1 has been already posted and it is due on uh, next Thursday that is February 7th in midnight. Uh, you need to submit it to canvas and for any question or comments or feedback regarding homework 1, you can post it in canvas discussion. So, if any other student have the same queries, so they can actually get help from it. So, let us start with ASIC design flow first. So, what is actually ASIC step stands for? It means application specific integrated circuit. So, if for example, I ask one of you to design a chip. So, uh, what you will ask me for the first time, the first very first time you ask me what is the design specification of the chip I want you to design. So, uh, by this design specification I mean what is the target specification, what is the clock frequency of your design, what is the power requirements, what is the memory budget. I mean all these design specification that relates to the uh, what is the feature of your design that actually comes in the, the first question when you start to design your chip. Like uh, iPhone X use a, Apple A11 Bionic chip. So, uh, the uh, clock frequency, the memory bandwidth, cache memories, its size, everything is mentioned here. So, this is the design specification that you need to know for the very first when you start working in a design. And the, the next thing that comes is actually what is the technology node and what is the implementation platform. By implementation platform, we actually have three options like you can use FPG or CPLD, you can use ASIC design or you can go for microprocessor. So, which one you are good to go? It actually depends on what is the performance requirements, what is the uh, production volume and uh, how much flexibility you want to have in your design. Like if you, if, if you go for microprocessor, you can implement in your program in microprocessor, like, right. But this one has a severe cost uh, performance issue, though it has some flexibility uh, leverage uh, and it, it also has some cost leverage. And when you go for FPGA, which uh, actually hurts you in terms of the cost, but it actually has the performance and flexibility uh, um, score. And if you have in, if, if you have in your mind that you want to go for something like big volume production and uh, you want to save uh, the power unit cost, so uh, in that case you need to go for uh, ASIC design because it will uh, provide you with low power unit cost and it will, uh, you can actually have the specific performance you want to have in your design. So, the, all these things actually depends on uh, what is the initial cost you can afford and how many, uh, what is the uh, volume of your production and uh, actually um, how much total cost is your target. Uh, so, uh, because you, uh, you can see that FPGA has very low initial cost, but when you design like if you, uh, uh, if you want to have, okay, uh, you, are, you are going to design a mobile chip. So, uh, most of the case there will be like 1 million of production. So, if you are going to design it in FPGA, it will, you will incur a, a huge amount of uh, uh, power unit cost. But if you go, uh, want to design uh, a very small volume of uh, chips like 1000 or 100, then you can easily go for uh, FPGA because uh, designing 1000 or 100 chips in 
AC, it, you will incur a huge amount of power needs. So, it actually depends on your performance, uh, what is the performance you are seeking for and what is your cost profile. So, you can see that uh, here you ha uh, we have a uh, actually a, uh, volume versus cost uh, profile for FPGA, ASIC and microprocessor. So, as I already mentioned that you can go for uh, ASIC when you have a la large volume target. Uh, and in every case, you can see that microprocessor has a lower uh, cost, right. But then why you are, we are actually not interested in microprocessor for specific design? It is because microprocessor has poor performance when you compare to FPGA and ASIC. Uh, I think you, all, you already have uh, covered the uh, HDL language course taken by Jason. So, you know that uh, hardware description language actually works parallelly. Like in your code, all the lines uh, start uh, compiling at a time. But in case of C programming or uh, this type of uh, lang uh, code uh, languages that runs in microprocessor, they actually run line by line. So, if you want to, if you are going to uh, implement an AES en en encryption core in a C programming language, like uh, for uh, this will take like thousands of instructions. But the same program will take far less instruction in uh, FPGA because it can you exploit the uh, feature of uh, parallelism in uh, if the hardware description language. Now, we will first start with what is actually uh, you know, when you start a design, uh, chip design, there are actually two major division, right? analog design and digital design. So, in case of analog design, the most of the case design are semi or fully custom. Like you can uh, you cannot do too much automate in your design. Uh, it's mostly because of analog has uh, different requirements, but uh, uh, and and uh, their design is not actually completely scalable. Like you uh, you, you have a uh, like you, you have a um, like clock generator that has that is designed in 90 nanometer, nanometer technology. You just cannot scale it down to 45 nanometer technology through scaling. Uh, but you can do this when you are uh, in digital design. So, and in case of digital design, you actually have the library prepared from your foundry, the uh, where you are going to do the fabrication. And uh, in case of digital design, you can use electronic design automation tools to perform all the placement and routing and uh, designing the flow plan and boundary, all these things. And uh, in case of analog, the analog design, there is one uh, leverage that uh, the way you design in your tool, it actually replicates the, the same performance when you fabricate the tool, fabricate the chip. But uh, in case of digital design, it does not always happen. This is pretty much a brief uh, order of the uh, ASIC design flow. So, you can see that it starts with uh, the design specification that I have already mentioned and the next it goes to the uh, functional design where you actually need to code the functional circuit. I mean if I ask you to design a FPU or an ALU circuit, you actually need to do the RTL coding, I mean the HDL coding in this step where you actually, uh, this is the functional design portion. Then you need to uh, like, uh, so at this step you have a bunch of HDL codes, those are specified in VVL uh, simulation. And the next thing you have to do is uh, you need to transform this VVL specification in gate level design. Like you need to implement the design in terms of logic gates. These logic gates are act you actually receive from the foundry while you are going to fabricate your design. So, the thing is you uh, for designing a chip, you at first you need library. So, this library where you find it from, you get it from your foundry where you are going to fabricate the design. This library is go, will going to be integrated throughout the all the steps in this ASIC design flow. So, the first where you are going to use this library is in design synthesis, where you are going to use this design library to synthesis to transform your behavioral code into logic get, get level netlist. Then, uh, it, during the synthesis process, you also need to make sure that uh, your uh, design is timing wise and all the performance feature wise like power, area, uh, you, you, are, you are good in this, uh, all those features. And you also need to make sure that the RTL code or a, uh, HDL code that you started with, 
uh, are functionally and logically equivalent with the code that you uh, with the get table native that you received after the synthesis process. So, at this step, we have our get level netlist that, that we actually receive uh, derived from uh, RTL course. So, next, what you need to do is uh, you need to insert uh, testing feature in your design. So, why we are actually integrating this testing feature at this step? We are not going to test the design the, the way we are actually inserting uh, right now. We will test the design after the fabrication. So, we are going to test the design after the fabrication, but we can change the design that at that step right so we have to integrate the testing feature in the design at this point where actually we can cha change or make any modification in the design so, so this one is actually done to make sure that the chip you deliver to the market those are actually does not have any fault or, i mean uh, any type of structural fault or any functionality fault it doesn't incur any type of this this things so, when testing is, uh, uh, test insertion is done, uh, you need to move to physical layout. Physical layout is actually the first step where you can, uh, you can actually see the, uh, how your, the layout of your chip, like how it is going to be, what is the boundary, is it rectangular or rectilinear or actually this is the first step where you, actually, you can physically overview how it is going to be placed, where is your IO pads, where, I mean where is your, uh, uh, how is going to be your power routing, how, how is your uh, power grid management. Everything you are going to first visualize at this step, which is called physical layout or physical design. And you also need to make sure that your chip is timing and physical violation wise clean. And you also need to make sure that it also, it meets your performance requirements and it is equivalent to the HDL code that you started with. Like you have gone through several uh, design modification step, like uh, you have already synthesized your design, you have inserted net uh, scan in your design. So, it, it sometimes it happens that uh, these steps change, uh, make some changes in your design. So, you need to make sure that these changes does not incur any functional changes. So, at the end of physical layout, what you receive is your GDS file. So, GDS file is just a binary file that defines all the mask and their geometric uh, um, coordinates. So, this GDS file is what we deliver to the foundry for fabrication. So, at the end of the fabrication, uh, foundry delivers the tested chips to the packaging and assembly section. From there, the chip goes to uh, end user, I mean the market. So, now, we will go through step by step in this process. First, it comes with RTL specification. At the uh, very first of RTL specification, you need to determine which HDL language you are going to use. Like you have three options here. You can use Verilog, you can use VHDL or you can use System Verilog. It depends on your uh, requirements. I mean, uh, at, and uh, it also depends on if there is any, uh, if your digital design also have any mixed signal design, this type of things. And uh, at this step, you need to determine what will be uh, your IO protocol, how you are going to interface your design with other modules. And also, you need to make sure that you partition your design into functional blocks. By this, I mean, like uh, if you are going to design a CPU, a CPU has lots of other modules. Like it, it will have a FPU, it will have a system block, it will have memory unit, and it will also have uh, some uh, logic division, all these things. And you need to make sure that you functionally part, uh, make partition of all these blocks. So, uh, it might be a question that why you, you need to partition these blocks. So, uh, the thing is currently the chips uh, that you actually, the um, electronic device you, you guys use, those actually have billions of transistors. So, for a EDA tool, it cannot handle all these automatic, auto, all these automatic placements, routing for so huge amount of gates. So, you need to make partition of your design, so that for each partition, you uh, make the design, you, you perform all the design steps at a time, and at the end of the phase, uh, at the end of the physical layout phase, you integrate all this. Uh, um, partition blocks, uh, logic uh, blocks uh, in, in your chip, and then you can have the whole design of your chip. So, uh, at this is uh, after this step, you will have the RTL files, and for uh, EDA tools, you can use any HDL simulator at this step. So, now you have designed your chip functionality. So, what you need to make sure first is, is your functionality correct? 
So, how you can do this? You need to perform this functional simulation. During functional simulation, we actually apply patterns in the design and uh, we check that uh, the way we thought our chip is going to work, is it really working that way. So, so you will actually, so you can easily understand that you need two things. You need your, you know, the article course that you have already written and you also need the uh, patterns you are going to apply in the chip, right. Uh, uh, I mean by chip, I mean actually you are going to apply in the tool. So, uh, this is actually called test match. We apply the patterns uh, for simulation in terms of uh, uh, by using this test bench, where you actually you mention what is, what is going to be the uh, inputs of uh, input values of uh, different uh, IO cores. And uh, what uh, at the end of this step, you get the simulation results uh, in terms of waveform or any textual assertion. And the main challenge is that the designing the test bench in an efficient and uh, sufficient way that you can apply less number of patterns but you get the most of it out of it. So, and you can use EDA tools like VCS or Jasper for this step. This is just a uh, example of uh, for your reference uh, where we actually we added a uh, half header and we performed the uh, functional simulation for half header using a test bench. So, the net, now your RTL code is ready, your RTL code is functionally proven what you need to do is transform your RTL code into hardware description, uh, hardware uh, implementation. Like you need to synthesize these RTL codes uh, for your, into your logic gates. Uh, uh, this is called HDL synthesis or logic synthesis. So, this step actually translates your uh, behavioral specification. It uh, performs gate level mapping and it optimizes your design. And uh, uh, optimize, it also optimize according to the specification you apply in the tool. Uh, it can be uh, uh, like uh, the area constraints you apply, the timing and power constraints, all these things. You need to have the library files, RTL ports and design constraint, which, which uh, we call SDC. SDC actually stands for synopsis design constraint. There actually you may, can mention the, what is going to be the clock period of your, of the clock you are applying in your design. What is going to be the duty cycle, what is the area constraint, what is all the timing budgets. You can specify this in SDC file. And when you uh, perform this HDL synthesis, at the uh, right of the slide, you can see that the behavioral specification transforms into this uh, logic gates. And you can use a design compiler uh, for this uh, HDL synthesis. Just to refresh you for uh, what is actually uh, VLSI testing, I think uh, um, Professor Tehini already covered this portion. So, uh, you, you, we actually we perform this testing at the end of fabrication, but uh, to make this happen, we need to integrate the testing features uh, uh, at the uh, design level. So, the, uh, so, why you actually do the testing? Because you need to make sure that you do not sell any bad chips to customer and um, actually a, um, and a, your image actually go away. So, you need to make sure that all the chips you sell to the customer, those are functionally uh, um, correct and those have all the features that are supposed to. So, after you insert the testing features in your design, uh, you move to physical design. So, uh, after, so uh, as you have the synthesized netlist, uh, get level netlist, uh, now you can uh, start your physical design. Uh, the things uh, that necessary for this step is your, uh, you need to have the design library, you need to have the get level netlist and you need to have the SDC files. And uh, the output of this step will be GDS2. Uh, you can use IC compiler uh, or encounter for this step. This step actually sums up uh, from several different uh, steps. I mean it comprises of uh, lots of steps. So, I will try to uh, walk you through each step briefly. At first, uh, it starts with flow panning. What is flow panning? Flow panning is actually you need to define the physical boundary of your chip and you need to make sure where is the um, I O pads are going to placed, where is uh, your, uh, how is going to be your pow uh, power grid management. I mean, uh, you can easily understand that um, like if your design has 1 million gates, so, uh, and those are actually getting the, uh, it's, uh, their power from uh, um, power rails. So, 
you need to make sure that your power is are power is are wide enough so that it, it can actually uh, it can actually provide enough uh, current to the um, uh, to your standard cells, right? So all these things are actually uh, made sure at this four plane space. And uh, you also uh, might have known that uh, like uh, when you start designing a uh, big chip, like if you start designing a CPU, you don't start it from scratch. You always use some pre-designed modules. Like you can buy some pre-designed modules from some other companies, or you can you can use some pre-designed modules from your previous design. So these we call IPs. And uh, there, uh, there are some uh, memory modules in the design. So all these, all these custom designs, those are actually pre-designed, or all, all the sales that you actually bought from other companies. So these, th these sales need to be placed at flow plan step. So what actually happens in the placement step? In placement step, you only place the standard sales of the design, like your logic gates, your flip flops, your sequential sales. All these things get placed in placement step, and any other non-standard cells, like if you design have any IPs, any SARDES, or any uh, other uh, custom cells, all these things will be placed at flow plane step. And also during placement step, you need to make sure that you make the placement and optimize the placement such a way that at the end of the placement and during routing, you will have enough resource for the routing. Like if you place two standard cells abut, then you, you, you actually kind of blocking the uh, pin of other cell, right? So you need to make sure that uh, you are placing the standard cell in such a way that you have enough resource for the routing. And it, it doesn't happen that you are going to place all the gates, uh, I mean, each gate uh, uh, like your cell. It actually, the tool does this. You, you just write the commands, uh, how actually tool are going to place the cells, that's it. When you have the placement database ready, the next big step is actually perform the routing. Routing means you need to connect your uh, standard cells uh, uh, in, uh, in between them, like uh, uh, you need to perform the interconnect routing in all of your cells. So um, you know that your sequential designs have clock, clock, clock routing, right? So uh, the, uh, it is customary that you perform the clock routing at the very first of routing step. Uh, then uh, uh, it's because that you know that uh, clock, clock nets are actually very sensitive. Right? It needs to ha maintain certain period, certain skew and sleeve. So uh, the, it, uh, it is good practice that you perform this clock routing at the very first, and then you go for the global routing. During global routing step, it uh, actually uh, it assigns the nets to the regions. It does not assign the nets. Uh, it, uh, it's actually a rough routing. It does not do the total detailed routing. Detail routing happens in detailed routing step, where the nets are actually assigned in the routing tracks. So at the end of detail routing, you will have different routing layers and vias in between them. So and uh, at this step, you also need to make sure that your uh, the way you route it, it does not incur any uh, DRC violation or LVS violation or any kind of uh, timing issues, all these things. So that's why this placement and routing step is kind of uh, iterative process. Like the way you thought your design is going to be good to go, you placed it some, somewhere and you perform the routing and you found, find out that there are some uh, DRC violations uh, or some timing violations. So what do you need to do then? Then you need to the, uh, uh, you need to analyze the violations, why actually these violations are going on. Then uh, analyzing these violations, you need to redo the placement or you need to actually iteratively change the placement and routing. So this way you can make sure that your design is timing and physical wise clean. And once this routing is done, you need to make sure uh, what you need to do is perform all the performance analysis. You need to do the timing analysis, physical analysis, all these things. So you know, uh, as your routing is done, these routing, these nets already have some length, width, and uh, height from the device layer. So any interconnect that, uh, like, uh, if I 
going through. Say for example, this gate is connected to this gate. So, if this has some width, so and say for example, its length is like L. So, for W, this width and this length, if I say that this uh, interconnect is uh, done by metal 2 layer, so this one has particular capacitors and resistors. So, where do you get this capacitance and resistance? You actually get this from the foundry, who is actually giving you the library. So, there you can get this uh, RC table for per unit length, which you can use to transform to uh, what is the D, uh, RC value for this interconnect. So, the, why this RC value is important? Because from this RC value, you can know what is the delay, what will be the delay of the signal to traverse from this point to this point. Right? So, the tool does this for the whole design, like for all the interconnects and it generates you the timing report. Uh, I believe uh, all of you are familiar with so what is set up violation and what is uh, hold violation. So, the tool actually performs all these delay analysis and it actually tells you which paths, which timing paths are actually not meeting, which timing paths are incurring set up violation or hold violation or actually a, what is the time it is supposed to be there in the uh, point, but it is not there. All these things are done by tool and tool is going to report you those violations. So, at this step you perform all these analysis and you make sure that, that your design is timing wise clean. And then uh, you also need to make sure that there is no physical violations like DRC violations or LVS violations in your design. And then you generate the GDS2 file of your design. So, what this GDS2 file has? GDS2 is nothing but a binary file that has all the geometric information of your design. Like if you have metal 2 for different re regions in your design, then it will say that metal 2 has a metal 2 is available in this, this, these regions. So, this is just a binary file that has all the mask information and all the uh, silicon information. And this is the file you are actually going to deliver to foundry for fabrication. So, the next thing is you need to uh, fabricate your design. Uh, this is the most costly step of your design. Like uh, nowadays, if you want to fabricate top of the line, uh, uh, in top of the line uh, technology node, it may cost, it actually it is not scary that it will cost you like more than 5 billion dollars. So, because actually uh, the, the whole process is very complex, sometimes it takes like uh, hundreds of steps. And um, this step is actually uh, done by uh, uh, making uh, masks and uh, performing photolithography on the silicon wafer. Then you go for the uh, post fabrication te testing. Most of the case, this uh, step is done by the foundry. They actually take the uh, wafer. Uh, each die in the wafer, uh, uh, they do perform this test by loading them into uh, automatic test uh, equipment tool and uh, they uh, also uh, load the uh, test, test pattern and the perform on the testing. And from there, uh, they also ma uh, uh, make sure which uh, dies are good and then they uh, perform the die, uh, uh, dicing of the uh, wafer. I mean, they, they cut the wafer into chips and they uh, provide these chips to the packaging facility. So, this is another very important step. Uh, nowadays, in some SOC, SOC means system of system on chip, which means you can have multiple chips in one system. So, it is very possible that in, uh, on, on top of single wafer, you have multiple chips. Like one chip is uh, uh, in, uh, in 3D way connected to another chip or like two chips are communicating to each other uh, from the device level, uh, uh, not through interconnects, through the device level. So, um, uh, so the, this one is a very important step and actually lots of uh, um, actually research goes on in how actually you are going to uh, make a um, feasible 3D GIC. So, uh, and uh, you also need to connect your IO pads with the outer world, uh, which you can do through ball grid array or you can use a flip chip method. So, uh, 
after the, the packaging is done, then you send your package chip to assembly. So, this is the step where this chip is going to be uh, put into the printed circuit board and uh, it will be a part of the electronic module. And this is the step where actually a, uh, it actually goes to the customer. So, this is this actually ends our uh, talk about the um, design flow. So, during this time you all heard me say EDA tools several times. What is actually this EDA tools? So, and why you actually need this EDA tools? I already mentioned that nowadays the chips are very complex. Like uh, you can see that uh, A11, Apple, Apple A11 chip has like 4.3 billion transistors in less than 100 millimeter square. Just think how many transistors are there in per millimeter square. So, and uh, if, if we try to do this, it is actually not possible to do in hand. Like you cannot do it manually. So, uh, and if it even you just think of doing it, there should be lots of human error. So, to mitigate all these issues, and also there is another issue is uh, there is a very aggressive time to market. Like you know that iPhone X was released one and a half years ago, and there is a the new iPhone is releasing every year. So, they are always in the rush that you need to make sure that you have new device every year. All the companies are going like this. So, that's why you need automatic uh, uh, automatic uh, uh, implementation of all these steps. There comes the EDA tools, and like uh, this is a funny example that uh, you, if you want to apply uh, implement this output, you can do this in kernel, right? But you, can you do this uh, uh, implement AES encryption core in kernel? It's you'll go nuts if you try to do this, right? So that we need EDA tools, and why actually we need to learn these tools because. Uh, um, it is extensively used in ASIC design flow and the license of these tools are very costly like millions of dollars and if you have uh, some knowledge of this tool, it will be very helpful for your uh, future career. So, there are several tools used in the, uh, the whole flow uh, like uh, for functional verification I have already mentioned that VCS or Jasper can be used and there are some other to tools used in all the for like uh, timing analysis you can use prime time these are actually verification tools. And there are also uh, uh, most of these are commercial tools, uh, but there are also some uh, very good open source tools. They might not be for the commercial use, but they are very good for your research purpose. Like ABC synthesis tool, uh, which is developed by Barclay. Uh, these are also this is a very good tool for uh, research purpose. And these EDA tools can be divided into three main category uh, for design entry, which is actually the very uh, uh, first step of your uh, design and uh, the like Vivado can be used at this step where you actually just uh, show the graphic uh, uh, view of the design and uh, design implementation. Uh, during design implementation like for logic synthesis we already mentioned that uh, you can use design compiler for like physical synthesis you can use physical uh, IC compiler and uh, so uh, there are uh, for different tools have different goal and different application like for verification there are other tools. These EDA tools are very powerful. So, how we can actually use these EDA tools for our security perspectives? So, we are going to uh, sh uh, show you some examples how we can actually use these uh, EDA tools uh, for security perspective. And uh, we ha we also have manuals uh, for that that I'll provide uh, after the, uh, this presentation. I'll upload this in the canvas. Uh, so, for that, uh, first you need to know two basic things. Uh, uh, what is logic obfuscation and what is hardware trojan? Uh, you will, uh, these two topics will be covered in our course uh, in uh, next couple of weeks and it will be covered very extensively. So, uh, I will just uh, give you an overview what is actually logic obfuscation and hardware, hardware trojan. Logic obfuscation is just like uh, if you have a design and you want to functionally log the design, like you uh, only you can unlock this design when you know the correct pattern. To do this, you apply uh, some gets in your design. So, such a way that when you apply correct inputs to the, those gets, only then correct output will show up in the 
uh, at the uh, in the inner circuit. So, if you apply incorrect inputs, you will have some incorrect output. Right? If you apply incorrect inputs in the key gates, you will have incorrect outputs. Only when you apply correct inputs in the key gates, then you can have correct outputs. So, this is what logic of frustration does. It functionally locks your design. And hardware torsion is is a malicious hardware that can be a actually integrated in your design by uh, uh, un, uh, unintentionally or intentionally, most of the case intentionally by some rogue person. And uh, it actually by including this uh, uh, malicious hardware, they can have uh, like malicious excess or uh, they can uh, actually, uh, they can actually gain malicious excess or control the, uh, the your device. And how actually we are going to, we can use EDA tools uh, for uh, detecting these things or how we analyzing these security things. Like VCS is used for uh, functional simulation of your RTL or gate level network. So, if you want to see when you apply uh, input a key gate in your uh, functional design, if you want to see how this key gate is, go, is corrupting your output, you can do this uh, using VCS. Like you can apply different, uh, different uh, patterns and perform the simulation you can see how this simulation is actually a uh, copying your output. And the same thing goes for hardware torsion. Like uh, you, uh, you can apply uh, several inputs and you can check how these inputs are changing the uh, outputs, how the switching is going, going, on, going on in different nets. And if you see that some nets are never going to uh, 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 turn on or never change the, uh, their uh, state, then what it means? It means that uh, those nets have very low switching probability. So when you have, when like uh, think about this way that you apply you include a hardware in a design, and you want to make sure that nobody gets to detect it. So what you will do, you will always try to make it silent, right? So that no other, no other can uh, actually look how it is actually going to work. So uh, so if your design, you can find that some gates are actually very silent, like uh, they never change your, their state. So, they are a very good candidate for your hardware torsion, right? So, you can detect these things using VCS and by performing uh, functional simulation. IFB tool is used for uh, formal verification for debugging purpose mostly. You can use this tool for torsion detection. So, uh, I, I know that some of you, some of the uh, projects already have torsion detection projects. And uh, you, you can, you can uh, before going to the hardware implementation, you can actually perform this simulation in the design to uh, actually ease your hardware implementation and hardware analysis process. Like uh, uh, IFB is such a tool where you apply a condition, IFB, uh, this tool will always try to find a counter example for that. Like if you apply a uh, condition where the torsion is always act, uh, inactive, then it will try to uh, find a condition where the torsion is active. I mean in which condition the torsion is active. So, uh, by doing this type of analysis and simulation, you can actually find the pattern which makes the torsion trigger. The next big tool is actually design compiler. Design compiler is a very powerful tool. We use this uh, like in des uh, chip design case, it is used for synthesis and DFT insertion. Uh, uh, it is also equipped with uh, lots of other features, like you can dump the switching uh, activity and uh, structural, uh, um, structure, structural profile of your design using this, uh, this tool. Uh, and uh, how we actually you can use this tool for security perspective, you can perform structural analysis, you can identify the optimum location for your key gates and uh, actually you can edit your design uh, using this tool. Tetramax is, is used for uh, generating test patterns and you can also use this tool for security perspective like uh, to identify the uh, key bits uh, that can be uh, derived from path sensitization and uh, you can identify which nets have low crop controllability or low switching probability. You can identify, it identify all these using this uh, Tetramax. How you can actually so uh, the, um, access this uh, EDA tools? Uh, in our uh, EC Linux server, we have access to all these tools. And uh, what you need to make sure that you just need to connect to the UF network. Uh, if you are working from offsite, then 
you need to make sure you have the you have VPN. Uh, then you can access these tools and uh, the detailed process how we can access this this uh, uh, access the EDA tools is actually mentioned in the uh, PDF attached to this presentation. So now I will walk you through uh, briefly and how you can uh, uh, through the uh, some manuals and how actually we can use these tools for security perspective. We will synthesize uh, an AES, then we will perform functional simulation, and then we will extract the uh, Trojan uh, from this AES. Yeah, sure. Uh, if you have any question, so feel free to. Um, we are as assuming that you have uh, basic understanding of uh, what is RTL, uh, what is the syntax of HDL language, uh, what is the grammar of uh, Verilog, and what is the standard cell library, the basics of design process. Uh, and we will uh, start doing the synthesis uh, in this uh, presentation. Uh, we will use design compiler for this step. Design compiler is actually developed by Synopsys, and it, uh, uh, it is a uh, very powerful tool. Uh, it uh, synthesizes your design, and it, it optimizes in terms of the uh, constraints that you apply in the design, and it supports a wide range of uh, um, design perspective, and you can do hierarchical design or flat level design, and let us see how we actually we can use this tool. So, to perform, uh, to, uh, to uh, use this tool, um, when you go uh, after this uh, class, when you, uh, if you want to use this tool, the first thing you need to make sure that you have these files in your uh, run directory. Uh, I will upload all these files in the canvas today. So, first you need to change the directory to your uh, synthesis uh, folder and then you need to make sure that you have this run compiler.tk available in your folder and you need to source uh, app settings which actually makes sure that you have access to all the EDA tools and you also need to make sure that all these, uh, these three vari uh, variables, they are properly set in your script, uh, I mean your run compiler.tkl file in such a way that uh, they have the true location uh, of the uh, mentioned paths. So, when you invoke a dc underscore shell command, it actually uh, uh, gets you into the design compiler tool. And if you want to uh, also show, uh, see the uh, uh, graphic interface, then you can just append the dash GUI portion, then it will actually invoke the uh, GUI. So, then you need to run the uh, source the run compiler.tkl file, it will synthesis, uh, perform the synthesis and optimization of your design. Uh, if you uh, all, uh, I will go through uh, the commands uh, here and uh, if you have any doubt in which commands are doing what, then you can, uh, the PDF is attached here, which is the synopsis manual for design compiler, you can uh, check there. And even uh, when you are using the tool, uh, you can go to the uh, uh, help toolbar. Uh, there is the man pages, you can also check the commands there. So, the first thing is you need to set the uh, design library and you need to set the uh, path where uh, your the tool is going to search for all the files and you also need to make sure that uh, you set the you set the proper uh, target library and you set the proper uh, link library. What is the difference between this target and link library? You can uh, just click in the uh, hyperlink and uh, uh, it will uh, go you through another uh, slide and there you can find the difference between these two commands. So, and the next thing is you need to define the working library, there the, all the intermediate files will be done. So, analyze command is used to read the uh, HDL files and if you have several files, you can use auto read command. Uh, with auto read command, you can actually set a directory so that uh, design compiler will use analyze command to read all the HDL files from that specific directory. And how auto read command is uh, uh, for like when you use auto read command, there are some other options you need to mention. You just need to click to the uh, hyperlink, it will tell you, uh, actually go you to an, uh, another page. 
Here you can see which options we need to make sure. So the next thing is you need to specify your uh, top module and uh, you need to perform the elaboration of your design and you need to state which is your current top module. And you also need to make sure you so, uh, link your library with your design and you uh, apply the correct constraints uh, in your design. So, the, this constant file actually uh, I already mentioned that it all, uh, just has the uh, all the clock frequency things and all the timing uh, budgets of your design. So, uh, the compile command is actually does the synthesis and optimization of your design. So, after you perform all these steps, you have the synthesized uh, uh, design. Uh, the, from the synthesized design, uh, from design compiler, you can write the uh, synthesized netlist or synthesized SDC file or SDF file uh, and you also need to make sure that you use the change name uh, command because uh, other than that you, design compiler will change the name of all the uh, components of your design. And you can use this uh, report underscore different features uh, commands to uh, dump the uh, report of your uh, design and check the area or any other. Then we will use uh, VCS tool uh, to perform the functional simulation. To run VCS tools, you need to uh, invoke this highlighted uh, colored command. Uh, you can see that there are four files mentioned after that. The first three are HDL files and the fourth one is the uh, test bench. And uh, the, this is the test bench that is designed, uh, that is under test. And you also need to make sure that uh, you add time scale in all your HDL files. This is the most common mistake, I think anyone performing simulation always face for the very first time. So, you need to make sure that all the files have proper time scale mentioned in the HDL files. So, after you invoke your VCS tool, you will see a GUI like this. So, uh, you can see that uh, at, uh, at the middle, there is a variable uh, mentioned. So, you need to make sure that you select the variable that you are going to plot in the waveform. Uh, you just need to right click on them and you will see that there is a option to add, add them to the waves. And after that, you will see a, a window like this will show up and you need to mention the uh, stop time of the simulation and press enter. So, the tool will simulate the design for this amount of time and it will show the value of different waveforms. Now, we will include a Trojan in our design and we will detect the Trojan using uh, IFB tool. So, uh, earlier we have been performing uh, the synthesis and simulation on AES. Now, we have included a, a uh, side channel Trojan in the uh, design, uh, which is actually implemented by the uh, top uh, bottom row. And what it does, it, uh, if your design have specific inputs for four consecutive states, it will trigger the Trojan. You can see that when the four consecutive states are met, I mean the state 0, state 1, state 2 and state 3, only then the Trojan will be triggered and it will leak the key through the side channel. So, and to invoke from uh, this IFB tool, you need to perform this command. Uh, uh, all these scripts and all these uh, uh, slides will be uploaded. So, I know actually the time is short. So, uh, you can actually go through them. And when you uh, perform this uh, simulation, so I just want to make sure, uh, correct you with two things that uh, you need to specify the bind info and uh, verification in it very carefully. This is actually the portion where you actually uh, tell the tool which uh, net you are going to look for the assertion. And you need to apply the assertion in the verification unit. Uh, you can see that we have asserted that uh, Trojan trigger never goes to 1. So, the I, what IFB tool will try to do, it will try to find a condition where this Trojan trigger will be 1. I mean, it will try to make a counter example of your uh, assertion. And when you do that, and after setting uh, proper uh, clock frequency and all the settings, uh, you will see that uh, IFB tool has performed the simulation it, and it has failed the design. Like, what your assertion has failed. I mean, it has successfully found a condition where the Trojan is triggered. 
And in the simulation, you can see that at the right of the edge, uh, there is a uh, uh, like I Trojan Tiger is actually turned on, and the red colored box actually is the pattern, uh, is the condition pattern when this Trojan Tiger is turned on. So, if you want to apply this uh, condition uh, uh, in the simulation tool like VCS, you can actually write the test bench from here and you can import this test bench and RTL codes into the VCS tool and perform the simulation there also. So, this is all from uh, me today. Uh, I hope you have already enjoyed it and if you have any question, uh, you can ask me here or, or you can also ask me uh, through Canvas, I will be happy to answer. No, no. It just he used the Trojan as an example. Yeah, just just you can you can use it for anything else that you design. So you can uh, design a multiplier. You can design your uh, CPU. You can design your AES circuitry, right? And you have to verify it for verification purpose. So you have to synthesize it. You have to do your Verilog simulation. You're gonna have to, you know, make sure that it actually functions the way you want it. So what you, when you write a code, what do you do? Often you try to do code test, right? You, you apply all sorts of conditions to it to see if it works and if it runs into any problem, what is the problem? So uh, hardware is no different. You have to do exact same thing. You write your code, you're gonna have to test it out, you're gonna apply all sorts of conditions to it, you apply workload, and some cases you actually create those assertions that uh, he was talking about, which means that, for example, you have an enable signal to memory that has to be only activated under certain condition. But you carry a different condition to see if ever gets activated. And if it does, you say, well, that should never happen, right? So it's actually a very tedious task. This is, this is quite simpler than, than what actually engineers do. And think about this, a Intel microprocessor probably has 300 verification engineers, right? So this is uh, just to give you ideas. You will use it for your um, uh, maybe one homework and then, of course, your project. Whether you uh, design a circuitry like Puff, whether you do Trojan detection or something else, this is important. Okay? Anybody else? Yes? I'm sorry, my, how, how do you get access? Was the question how many or how? How do you? Uh, Andrew? Okay. Oh, that's easy. No. Yeah, it's, it's going to be available. Okay. Even for the uh, traces for the side channel project? So for the side channel project, they can do that at running it. Okay. Keep in mind that the files are kind of large. So one mm -hmm. file is a gigabyte, and then the other file is a four gigabyte. So it affects the things that you get at five gigabytes. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's all in project. Very good. Okay. Yes? Excuse, excuse me, yeah. So we had a two XOR plus. Mm -hmm. uh, are we creating that in hardware or software? Or? All in the FPGA, correct? Project Just one? Project yeah. one, yeah. Okay. So, so can you remind me, project one is the modeling attack. Okay, so now that's just the model. You don't have to actually implement it, yeah. So remember that there are papers that when you read those papers, the modeling becomes very easy because those papers are explaining the modeling very, very clearly. Okay? Any other questions? Yes? Um, so how does this presentation work, like the topic that we're supposed to research? Uh, you mean the paper presentation? Yeah. So Andrew, do we have a uh, template? I think last year we gave a student some template uh, that they could use to present their slides. Yeah, we put them on the web and you can grab it in uh, 15 to 17 minutes of presentation. So don't, I, I strongly suggest don't go more than 15 to 17 slides. I've seen some people say, well, I'm going to prepare 30 slides, but I'm going to finish it in, in, in 15 minutes. It just doesn't work. Don't do that. So find a way to put them into 15 to 16 slides. And then every four slides, every five slides, one student is responsible to present. One student present the introduction. One student present the main idea. Another student can say, hey, here is the uh, implementation setup. Another student can talk about what the findings were. Okay? So sh divide it equally among yourself, but don't, don't, don't try to uh, 
go with uh, too many slides. Experience from the past tells me that you can't finish it. And points will be deducted if you can't finish it in time. All right? Any other questions? All right, guys, uh, let me just, before you go, how was the uh, puff uh, lecture? And how was the quiz? All right, the quiz will tell me, right? OK, well, I'm going to probably uh, pick your brain a little bit beginning of the next session, and then we're going to talk about a scan. A scan should take 10 minutes. After that, we're off to the next topic. All right, guys, see you on uh, Tuesday.